start to talk a little bit about the visual pieces because, A, because that's something that I care about as the designer and also just because this is a design school, um, obviously you're all pretty visually literate. And one of the things I was very sensitive to was not having it look like a style book so much. Um, almost having this, as you can see in those gray pages, almost having uh, quite a subdued readerly style to it so it wouldn't, it wouldn't date quickly. You know, you, you look at a, a copy of, I don't know, Domus even, or Italian Vogue from 1992, and you can see it. You can, you can really, I mean, all of you as designers and design students and readers know what I'm talking about. So what I wanted to do was make sure that going through the pages, there was never more than, I'll go back, never more than sort of five or six pages of gray type like this. I always wanted a chapter that was going to explain something visually or, you know, these were, um, these were these poems I made up based on textile names. And so I went into archives and just found names of textiles from the 50s and 60s and just made sort of an artistically shaped poem out of them. So it also just, what it does to the page is it, it doesn't tire the eye. It gives, it, you know, just gives a lot of traction. Um, but let me see where I am in my talk. Yeah, I'm going to talk about the visuals in a second. So this was one, um, one chapter that was close to my heart because as I was making the book, I was pregnant. And I was sort of, I mean, I'm a little depressive, so I was sort of mourning the, the person that I was that my daughter would never meet. There really is quite a cutoff as a mother in terms of who you are, who you were, and who you are. And um, so what, what I wanted to do was ask women to send in pictures of their mothers before they had children. And instead of talking about their clothes or the cool retro styles, I just wanted them to talk very plainly about the woman they saw. And often it, it wound up talking about clothes because, again, it's a visual exercise I'm asking. But the... Um, the text was so much more emotional. And, and the pictures sort of give you that hit of retro style anyway. You don't have to, you don't have to talk about it. And so, you know, there's, they're, they're really poignant and they really do get at, um, they do get at in an oblique way how, how women see their mothers is a lot of the time tied up in, in their own style as they age. Like a lot of women said, oh, I wish I still had that thing, or look at her, I've never seen her so happy. <laughs> or, um, uh, I don't know, there was, a, there was a lovely tenderness to it. So this, this section happens twice in the book, um, and it was really fun to work on. And it just sort of, in terms of design, breaks up the gray, the gray chapters. So um, I'm going to take you through some of the visual features that we did, again, um, because I f what I found these were useful for was um, showing a different way to look at style, showing a different way to look at, um, to look at women that wasn't necessarily in this mode of um, fashion or fashion images. So we asked a number of women what they did in public when they didn't have a mirror to groom themselves, and we got the most fantastic answers, sort of, you know, to checking teeth and knife reflection and blotting oily face with the toilet seat cover and, uh, you know, licking your finger and taming your eyebrow. And then I asked this performance artist, Rachel Perry Welty, to act them out. And these are actually film stills. She does, you know, so it exists, the, this piece exists in film too. But that was sort of one way that's much more illustrative than just going, oh, floss your teeth with a, you know, a bitten fingernail or... Anyway, so that's, that was one example. And it also just acted as a, as a pause. This was an, another one where um, the three editors, uh, Sheila, Heidi, and I, took a picture of our floor after we had decided what to wear. And so <laughs> this is unfortunately, shamefully, what my floor looks like 
pretty much every day because I take a lot of time deciding what to wear. And then I, we all wrote out the kind of the process of rejection and uh, selection that we went through. Um, I got this idea from a visual artist, a British visual artist named Georgina Starr, um, who would who used maps in some of some of her artworks. Um, so that's it. that was another sort of way at looking at choice. Um, okay, so this one's a fun one. When we did when we did ask visual artists and and writers to um, collaborate, it was just sort of like give us what you got. If it's a good idea, we'll do it. Or if not, and Miranda came up with such a great idea um, that actually works best probably in a grid as a poster, but because we couldn't publish it that way, I, um, I did it this way. And what she did was she put an ad on Craigslist asking women, v weirdly, vaguely of the same proportion, to show up at a studio on a given day in their favorite outfit. And Molly Ringwald was, um, was uh, the first person to sort of volunteer to do this. And, um, the, the, sort of, the proportions were sort of based on her own, so all of the women could, could shift around. And so these are left-hand pages and right-hand pages. But as you see them, these are the outfits they showed up in, this first one. And then what happens is you see the outfits sort of shift to the left one. And so every woman gets to wear someone else's outfit. And it's this lovely, quiet exercise in how we see women and how we judge them. So, you know, if we saw Molly wearing that, or if we saw this, you know, Molly's wearing her outfit, um, it's just, you know, it, it, it almost, I don't even have to talk about it. It's just so fun to see. And when you do put it all in a grid, you see the outfit go diagonally down the page. Um, and I think Miranda might have made a poster of it. I hope she has. But... Again, far more effective, I think, than Miranda writing about looking at women. And, and I love this kind of writing. I do call it writing because it takes as much planning and effort and, um, and work. This was something that I had kind of in the back of my mind um, for a while because I get catalogs and I, get, and I have a collection of old magazines. Um, and that I keep, I mean, I don't know how many of you have old magazines you keep. It's just fun to just keep them. I feel like they're books. And so um, what I wanted to do was have an actress who had a good sense of her body to, um, and, and, you know, not a model and not model proportions to, you know, strip down to the leotard and imitate each of these poses. And not critically, just sort of very flatly, very you know, matter-of-factly. And we shot this, I think, in an hour and a half before Zasha had to fly somewhere. It was the fastest, most easy shoot I've ever worked on. And so you can sort of see, you know, Aquatic World, um, People Magazine, 1980, Black Beauty, 2013, The Gentlewoman, Vogue Italia, 2000. These are based on what I get in the mail and what I have in my library. So it, it isn't even an academic or scholarly critique of the, fa the magazine industry. It's just literally what I had on my floor in stacks. Um, but it, um, it does function as, as a real little taxonomy of poses. And I really didn't want her to imitate the facial expressions on the models. I wanted her to be deadpan so you would just get these contortions. And I also liked that in terms of how the book worked, you know how um, old 70s yoga books and exercise books and sometimes women's magazines like Self have these calisthenic exercises you do with big balls or mats. I wanted something in the book that felt a little bit like those silly exercises that have the model in the the leotard, and um, it sort of functions that way, which, which is nice. This was a feature that I did at my old, all, I guess, alma mater at the New York Times, and only because I had access to, I you know, still knew people there, 
but what I wanted to do was go to an office building and talk to women about their rings. And again, a way into fashion without being label or, or um, status or advertising driven. And just talk, you know, this is about something that is their body temperature. This is about something that women wear every day, jewelry. Because um, we didn't really cover jewelry um, that much. And so I just had them put their hand on the photocopier, palm up, um, and it's, it's a photocopy. This is the cheapest, cheapest uh, feature we had. Um, and the stories, I just taped on my iPhone. Okay, tell me about this ring. So it's, you know, the gold one is a wedding band. The original wedding band has been lost. I also like to buy $10, $15 rings at flea markets, like this purple one. And anyway, it was a, it was a really, really easy, really fun way to get stories about jewelry and meaning and also get these women's histories like oh uh, this was my grandmother's or I lost this for 10 years and then found it in a hoodie and all these lovely little life stories this is Ruth LaFerla who's the uh, New York one of the New York Times style reporters she's really good and so she has these sort of Cartiers and her her parents diamond rings and hers I think was the most stylish hand in there um but again, just a very low-fi, low production value way to talk about style and um, design it. And the hands in the book are humans, are actual size, which was fun to do. Okay, so this is another example of how, um, how design and, and text worked and how you can, as a, as a, as a you know, design and style journalist really take it to another place. Um, Heidi had a friend who knew a smell scientist, who knew a, a, a scent scientist. And so Heidi did a great interview with her that's in the book. And then I said, oh, we have to do something more. Like, what, what can we possibly do? It's November. No, it was February. And um, I just wanted her kind of, out on the street or something. So I said, what if we send her to, my husband works in restaurants, and I said, what if we send her to the restaurant and send her down to the coat check and had her smell the coats and just give these analysis of these people's personalities? Do you think she would do that? And Heidi said, she'll absolutely do that. So without naming the restaurant, because like, who wants their coats sniffed by some stranger, we sent her to this very fashionable downtown restaurant in New York and had her sort of turn these coats inside out and smell the armpits and smell the necks and, and, um, and talk about what she smelled and sort of analyze these people. And the result is very funny, but I had to also then figure out a way of laying it out so it wouldn't just read sort of boringly. And so we, I found these little, little floral dingbats and then um, just laid it out as, as this sort of dialogue in italics, which seemed to work. But again, just a, another way of showing information. But it was a good one. She was actually very harsh. She was very mean. I think she wore like that Dries Van Noten rubbery stuff. And so when she would come across Axe body spray, she would just freak out. This was actually one of my favorite pieces because, again, it takes style and design to, into the personality of a woman. Mike Alexia is a Canadian artist who works in, in uh, text and metal a lot. And um, he had uh, a collection of women's signatures. And I really think that this is not only that whole thing about, oh, what your, sig what your handwriting tells about you, but it's just, we all know what it's like to sign. It is absolutely an extension of our style. And so to see a woman write out her name a number of times is something it's almost like hearing someone practice singing, or it's such a, a personal thing. And I loved how just artistically it looked. You know, why did Jean cross that one out? <laughs> um, this, I think, was a, a, something like a nine-year-old, a little girl. Mandy's, Mandy filled two pages. They look exactly the same, oh, like no deviation there. But again, the, you just start to think, oh, this woman probably has a little bit of a uniform, or, or maybe not, and this is, her, this is her consistency. Like, I just loved what it said about style. 
I mean, this also belies my own taste in things like I like getting under and underneath. I asked a bunch of women to send little iPhone pictures of the stains on their clothes and tell me what they were. And again, I think that this sort of use and wear and, and everything, um, again, gives an insight into how we use our clothes and love our clothes or throw away our clothes after they get stained. Um, just these little abstract blobs, blood, yogurt, bicycle grease. Again, just a, a small way of looking at, at style or slobbery or <laughs> something. This was another fun one. And I kind of want, I sort of think that stores could use this data. I mean, I think a lot of places could use a lot of the research we did as data, but this is how one woman walked through the stores. Um, you know, and pretty, pretty much chain stores like Zara, H&M, Anthropology. Um, and so there's just this path. And I hadn't seen that before, but again, it, it, it sort of abstracted shopping, it abstracted desire, and it, it kind of, it, it was, I don't know, sort of animal-like, these little patterns that we take, and where the black dots are when she touched something. And so, I don't know, these stores should just be using this, I think, <laughs> to sort of chart stuff, or send someone through every season. Okay, this was the most fun one, was, um, because I was insisting on not having that many pictures of women or having pictures of the women who answered the surveys, what I wanted to do was show their clothes to be these oblique portraits of women. And what I asked was if women owned more than, seven, more than six of something or six and more of something. And invariably, most women do own more than six of something. I mean, I'll ask you in our question period, but this woman's collection was over the knee socks and I don't have to narrate this but you can basically see what women have in multiple and I think this speaks more to style than what you know the question who are your favorite designers it's sort of like I'd rather see this than than understand that and it does talk about you know, OCD and consumption and um, excess that I think is a big part of, of what's happening now and not, not a very good part. Um, one of my favorite pieces in the book is an interview with um, four Cambodian sweatshop workers who make bras for, you know, higher-end stores. And instead of asking them, about the politics or the working conditions, we just said, talk about what you're wearing. And they talk about wearing material that's thin because the factories are so hot. They talk about wearing brighter, garish colors because they can't afford the muted, beautiful colors that they actually really like. Um, and that was, I feel more effective in me thinking about who was making my clothes than you know, some report on, on um, abuses in these places because now I think about them every time I shop and I've changed how I shop um, because of that. So I'm really happy that that piece is in the book. Um, Sheila found a translator to talk to those women. <laughs>